I am so pleased to have uh, you here with us today. I, a little birdie told me that you might be taking a red eye at home to vote tomorrow. So I hope everyone appreciates your time. Um, I know I certainly do, and I'm so happy you're here. Uh, just a, if you don't already know who Congressman Curtis is, uh, he has represented Utah's third congressional district since 2017, and before that served as the mayor of Provo, Utah for eight years. Before joining Congress, he was a small business owner, giving him personal experience in how national policies impact small businesses in his district. Congressman Curtis also is the current chair of the Conservative Climate Caucus, which is a lovely alliteration with 72 members, and serves, as the House Energy, uh, serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, including the Big Tech Subcommittee, which sounds very cool. You'll have to tell us more about that. Um, we thank you for your service and, and certainly for your time. And I know this audience is eager to hear from you. So, so let's get into it. Um, as Dimitri mentioned in the previous session, the theme for this conference is fight for the future. And we are truly in the decisive decade for our national security, for our climate security, perhaps even the decisive century. Our energy security is obviously inextricably linked with our national security and our economic security. And as a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, can you talk a little bit about what you think the approach to energy security should be for the United States? Sure, first of all, uh, Maureen, it's a delight to be with you. Dimitri, thank you for having me here to all of you. Uh, I'm really pleased to be with you, particularly if you know that I left 23 degrees this morning. <laughs> I wish I could spend uh, more time with you. Uh, let me just, if I could, give you two slices out of my life and then kind of tell you how that answers your question. Um, a little over a year ago, the Conservative Climate Caucus was invited to Europe uh, by the Europeans because they wanted to show us what they were doing on climate. And so we went over there. Unbeknownst to us and them, we were there the Monday before the war broke out. We were there while the war broke out and several days after the war broke out. And we saw firsthand what happens when you pursue clean at the expense of every other um, uh, goal, right? Including energy security. Uh, now, uh, go back with me. Uh, you weren't born, but in the 70s uh, when I was- I was born in the 70s. Okay. 79. Right. Oh, okay, <laughs> barely. I made, I made it in. All <laughs> right. Um, those of us looking around the room, there's some of us who remember the 70s where we learned what happened where a foreign entity could hold us hostage with energy. And what's interesting is even as a very young man, I remember consciously the country making a decision that we were going to be energy independent. And what was interesting about that, I think at the time it was as unknown as it is today about how we're going to be become clean, right? We didn't know how we could be, there was no path to energy independence as the United States. We didn't have the vast reserves that the, the Middle East has. But US innovation and US technology brought us there. And I'm a very optimistic person and I think we can do that again. I, I love that, and you're touching on, a, on an issue that's very near and dear to my heart, which is the idea that we have a clean energy future, but that the path is maybe not the path that is currently envisioned, which is an over-dependence on things like wind and solar, uh, when anyone who sort of has to run a utility knows that your first couple of priorities are things like reliability, safety, uh, you know, generation to all your clients, and then maybe, uh, then maybe a um, <clears throat> uh, a deference to or towards clean sources. So can you tell us a little bit about you know, what you think in terms yeah. of technology mix and what might work for the United States? So, I, well, you, you, you kind of answered my question, but let me, my prediction is that when we get to 2050 or sometime down the road, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna be fixed on basically four things. Affordability, reliability, safety, and clean, right? And that's perhaps the path that Europe, uh, where they made a mistake, is it was all clean. None of these other things mattered. They do matter. And, if, and if, you, if you get there like Europe did and you're moving towards clean but you're not affordable, we, we have a serious problem. If you look at almost every energy source, well, let me just say every energy source, it has an Achilles heel. So for wind and solar, it's reliability and storage. For nuclear, it's cost and perhaps safety. For fossil fuels, it's emissions, right? So every, everything has an Achilles heel if we're talking about affordable, reliable, safe, and clean. And I actually believe the, 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 each one of those industries needs to work on their Achilles heel. And I believe when we get to 2050, 
they're all going to be there, and they're all have going to made massive improvements on these Achilles heels. Well, that's amazing, and I, I love your optimism. So uh, turning a little bit back to a viability in that optimism, how, pol how do you think uh, politically both in D.C. as well as in the country uh, across where, you know, uh, communities actually have to implement technologies. Um, do you think that they could pr uh, embrace energy mix that might include more controversial sources such as nuclear and geothermal? Um, so I will tell you, I, in my short time in Washington, I've seen, let me just break those down, nuclear first. I've seen a, a huge shift in, in nuclear. And there's some pretty smart people here in this room today. I'll bet you nobody in this room could draw a path to a affordable, reliable, safe, clean future without nuclear. And more and more, right and left are, are acknowledging this fact that nuclear has to be there if we're going to, if we're going to be there, particularly on the clean side. And so um, whether you're a cop or in the halls of Washington, D.C., people are talking nuclear and they're very serious about it. And the bigger question is, how do we move quicker, right? We're going to need literally hundreds of nuclear facilities if we're going to reach our goals. And so I think there's a, a bright future for nuclear. And I think we can do it clean, safe, affordable, and reliable. Uh, geothermal, I spent uh, a little bit of time over in Iceland. And of course, they power the whole country on geothermal. It's amazing. And Utah, where I'm from, uh, actually has some capacity for geothermal. It's exciting. And, and I think we, we, we've got to be thinking about it. And it's also popular right and left. It's popular back in DC. Um, and I, I, I think there's a good future for geothermal. It turns out we're really good at drilling and you need to make, drill deep wells <laughs> yeah. to, to do deep well geothermal. Exactly. And certainly, you know, want to echo your points on nuclear. Um, I, I don't think there's a future without nuclear. And, um, you know, I always uh, jokingly tell my, my friends that, you know, I'm such a big fan. I'd put a reactor in the back of my, my, in my backyard if I could. I'm the anti-NIMBY <laughs> on nuclear. Uh, but that's also probably because I'm a little bit of a prepper. <laughs> can, I, can I interject just slightly yeah, right there? By all means. So I represent a district that it, that's, has a lot of coal and oil and gas. And particularly in my coal region, we have coal fire plants that are closing down that have these transmission lines right to them. It's a perfect place for small nuclear reactors and these economies, it's one of the ways we could help these economies that are really struggling in a transition. And it's a great answer uh, for these small communities. Absolutely, I agree. And it's a great answer to you know things like kids with asthma. Um, so, Regardless of these exciting new technologies, we certainly know that the grid is going to be, have a lot of batteries and a lot of um, solar and a lot of wind occupying the grid regardless of, of what we do. And those technologies require a lot of minerals that we do not make and process here, like cobalt, lithium, and nickel. Um, if we're going to meet those, that projected demand for these technologies, we have to secure new sources of supply, both here and, and abroad. Um, I'd love to know uh, what you think the prospects are for for pushing permitting for reform in Congress, and is that would it, would that incentivize mining and processing here in the U.S.? Yeah, let me first tackle this mining uh, issue. We have a problem here in the United States, and that is that somehow if we don't see it, it's okay. So it's okay to, to take uh, 12, 13, 14 year olds and uh, let them work out there in, in the Congo mining uh, these materials, that's okay because we don't see it. It's okay in, in China to have the Uyghurs uh, mining this because we don't see it. And yet we're not willing to bring that home where we have the cleanest standards. We have emission standards, human rights standards, um, OSHA standards, right, where we could do it safer and cleaner here. And there seems to be this, this wall that says it's okay over there uh, but it's not okay here. And that wall must be broken down. It just must be for, for all sorts of reasons. And um, we are having some pretty serious discussions in Washington, D.C. about permitting reform. It turns out that everybody wants it. Um, it you can't build a, a, a solar farm, a wind farm, because of permitting. Um, you can't build a pipeline. You can't build transmission lines. And it's all permitting. As a matter of fact, if you take any climate goal that anybody has or any energy goal that anyone has, permitting reform is blocking it from happening. And so Republicans, Democrats, right and left, are starting to have this discussion about how do we find this, this place? It's a little bit uncomfortable, this conversation, because my Democratic colleagues don't want to talk pipelines. Um, Quite frankly, Republicans are a little bit more willing to talk. They don't really mind solar and wind. They just don't think it's the only answer. 
But there's some really thoughtful discussions going on. We're going to introduce this week a bill called HR1. It's going to have permitting reform in it. If I'm honest, it's very partisan. But it's a starting point. And, um, and, and those who have been involved in putting it together are very quick to say, OK, here's our marker. Now, now where's yours? And let's talk. And let's see if we can't find a path forward. I'm very optimistic, but I will tell you what. Even the best legislation doesn't make it through in Washington, D.C. under the best of circumstances. So although this has some headwinds and it looks very possible, um, it really needs to be nurtured and taken care of if we're going to get it across the finish line. Well, that's great. And, you know, certainly may, may, it seems like it may be time for another congressional visit to Europe because life without a fuel is actually a really bad <laughs> it's life. Not a, it's not a good place to be, right? <laughs> you need our fuel yeah. and you need pipelines for fuel. Um, so... Sp Thinking of the, the agenda and, and, and prospects, uh, as the Conservative Climate Caucus Chair, we, you just let us know about, about permitting. Um, what do you think has the, the most uh, potential in this current uh, congressional window? Uh, does per would permitting, for instance, include uh, transmission line upgrades? Um, recognizing that, of course, federal level uh, the federal level permitting is only part of the problem. A lot of the the, the, the barriers are state level barriers. And then, of course, what do we do about the trade offs between what we require here and require abroad? And of course, I'm talking about um, border adjustments. Okay, um, believe it or not, there are some Republicans talking border adjustment. Oh, I know. It's an early conversation, right, for us. Um, but it, it, a really good way to approach it is um, we're all kind of grumpy about China, right, and what's happening over there. And this is if you approach it from that perspective and say, look, how do we level the playing field for American businesses with China? I like to talk about, I use this analogy, you go into Walmart and you see two toasters. One's $20 and one's $10. Well, we know the $10 one came from China. The $20 toaster is subject to human rights standards, to emission standards, to all sorts of regulations. How do we, how do we level that playing field and put that, that burden on that $10 toaster? And, and I, that, that seems to should be a bipartisan issue, right? That should be a, a very, very good conversation to be having right now about this, this level of the playing field. That's a pretty good Republican value. And um, I'm hoping that it can get some momentum and, um, and find a comfortable spot because it, it, I think it's actually a pretty good way to address some of these issues. Yeah, and I agree. And you know, certainly, I um, in, during my professional life in government, working with a lot of manufacturers, what I would hear time and time again is not so much frustration with our requirements in the U.S. We're actually a high, we have a high compliance culture. It was frustration of having to compete in your own market with a product that was made, that was produced under inferior conditions. I, I tell you, I, I hate to admit this, and I know this is being streamed, so like um, everybody will know about this, but a year or two ago, I was I decided to get a, a electric lawnmower. And I went down to my local hardware store, and they had this green one, and it was from China. I said, I, no way I'm going to buy a, a, a lawnmower from China. So I got online, and I bought a Toro. The thing arrives at my home, I unpack it, and of course it says, made in China, right, <laughs> on it. And, and, you know, how does a U.S. business compete, right, yeah. with that? Um, and you're, you're right. U.S. business, they're fine with regulations. You know what I hear from most is I don't mind regulations. Just don't change them on me and don't make me compete with somebody who doesn't have them. Exactly. Make it, make it easy to comply and uh, certainly don't make yep. me compete with somebody who gets to undercut me and particularly my own market. Well, the exciting thing is that with, uh, you know, so many members in the Conservative Climate Caucus, 72 at last count. Okay, wait a minute. Don't shortchange us. We're at 80. I'm oh, just saying. 80 well, members. And if you don't you, know what that is, these are, these are Republican members of the U.S. House of Congress who have signed up to be part of the Conservative Climate Caucus. And if I had told you a couple years ago that a third of all Republican members would be part of any caucus dealing with the climate, nobody would have believed me. And they're serious and they're engaged. And uh, it's really fun to be part of. It's an exciting progression. And I know you're a founder. So thank you for all your hard work and pressing the agenda forward. Um, is, the, is the now 80-member caucus <laughs> yeah. at a place of educating and socializing still? Or do you have some, some sort of ag agenda items that we're tr you're trying to push forward as a caucus? So uh, last Congress, uh, Kevin McCarthy put together a select committee on climate. 
for Republicans, and we had our Conservative Climate Caucus, and they both pay, play a really important role. <clears throat> the, the select committees, they were supposed to put meat on the bone, and our job was to get Republicans to understand what the nuances were, and what they wanted to support, and why they were important. So these two worked very well together. Um, you'll see a little bit of merging of that uh, going forward. It's not, it is probably, we want to do more than just educate Republicans. We want to move things forward. Um, but right now, it's pretty exciting just to have Republicans willing to talk about climate. It's pretty fantastic, I agree. And I think climate's actually an area where the U.S. can fight and lead in the future. Um, do you see any sort of uh, upcoming opportunities on climate policy, and at the, in particular in the intersection between climate policy and national security? I do, and um, you know, I think the difference between now and before the, the war in Ukraine is we used to talk about energy and we used to talk about climate, and now it's like almost every conversation, you cannot separate these two. You cannot separate energy policy, energy independence from a climate conversation, and, and they're more intertwined than ever, and um, I think you, you, you'll see both thoughtful people on both the right and the left advancing energy policy and climate policy that is healthy for us, right? Um, it, a real pushback on this narrative, that it, this is the thing I think that kept a lot of Republicans out of the debate for a long time, is there was this sense of you had, to, you had to abandon affordability, reliability, so that you can be clean. And that's kind of what Europe did. And I think the approach that we're taking is, look, no, we can be affordable, reliable, safe, and clean, and we're going to show you how to do that. Absolutely. Well, you've been so generous with your time. This has been a real pleasure, and thank you for flying across, across the country. I won't tell anyone about your emissions. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I wanted to invite our USG speakers up to the, up to the podium next. Thanks very much, Marie.